Hey, what's up everyone? It's Joe from Gadgetry Tech, and in today's video we're talking about two new keyboards from Rockat, the Vulcan Mini Air and the Vulcan 2 Mechanical. The Vulcan 2 Mechanical is available in white or black and has an MSRP of $149.99. And the Vulcan Mini Air is also available in white and black, but has an MSRP of $179.99. Now at the time of filming this, the pre-order option only lets you pick the red switch. However, if you scroll down on the website, it shows the brown switch is an option as well. So I think the brown switch will soon become available, maybe when it goes live and the pre-order side ends. Uh, but basically, they're very similar switches. They have the same 45 gram actuation pressure. The browns are a little bit more tactile. There's more of like a little bump that you feel in the middle and it has a longer actuation distance of 1.8 millimeters, whereas the red is 1.4. The reds are also slightly more quiet, they're very linear, so if you're looking for the fastest possible speed, you tend to lead towards the red. But if you want to have, I guess, less of a chance of accidental keystrokes, or you like that tactile feel to have a sure-footed keystroke, then the brown would be better for that. Now the Vulcan Mini Air is a 65% keyboard and it's called the Air because it's wireless. There's a couple of cool things I like about this being a wireless keyboard because you can still use it as a dedicated USB keyboard. There's a detachable USB-C cable included. The transmitter integrates into the chassis, but if you don't want to use the transmitter, it also has Bluetooth. There are three Bluetooth profiles built into the keyboard, which means you can connect this to multiple devices and through the keyboard seamlessly switch between each profile. Naturally, whenever you have a wireless keyboard with RGB, you have to consider battery life, and the battery life of the Mini Air varies greatly depending on your settings, how often you use it, what your RGB is set to, etc. So in the quote-unquote party mode, according to them, you can get about 90 hours of battery life. That's still taken into account the keyboard disabling RGB after it's sitting for a long period of time. Now through the Rockhead Swarm software, you can choose that timeout. How fast does the RGB dim and turn off and when does the keyboard go into standby? And all of these settings will of course change your battery life. So they, they rate it for approximately 90 hours with RGB being used more often. And then on the stretch side of things, if you're using it occasionally, let's say your keyboard is left on, but RGB is disabled the entire time, it's never allowed to turn on, you can expect up to you know, about 750 hours of battery life. Real world use, just to let you know how I would use it, you know, I'm not buying a keyboard like this to not use RGB. I, I like the way the Vulcan keyboards have presented RGB. That's actually been a huge selling point in the past. Because they have these shallow keys and these really bright LEDs, they are one of the brightest looking keyboards on the market. So for how I used it of occasional use, about eight to 10 hours a day, after about day four, as I was getting through day four, I was due for a charge. So keep that in mind. I'm using it a lot because I was using it for work during the day as well. Your mileage may vary, but just to give you a ballpark of what to expect. Now being a mini keyboard, there are additional keystroke functions built into the board and you can use the function key to adjust that. They also have, at least on the newer Vulcan keyboards, a dual LED illuminated key which means you can actually have status lights put in. So if you have a wireless mouse, I don't know if you can see it on the camera here, but character B, there's a little mouse, sim mouse symbol, and there's a bottom LED that lights up independently from your RGB settings. So if you have a Rockat wireless mouse, for example, and the batteries run down halfway through, that light will now be a yellowish color. So they're using additional LEDs to give you more status, and if you're ever concerned or curious which ones are what, not only do you have these characters here, but you can identify that in the Swarm software. I talk about the Swarm software because some people may not like these keys. Both of these keyboards use ABS keycaps. That's my biggest gripe with this new launch is I was really, really hoping they would embrace uh, PBT caps. They're just more durable. Uh, ABS can look better on the RGB side, but it really just depends on how it's made. These look beautiful just expect a little bit of a shine over time. Now, because they use a third-party compatible cross-shaped keycap, you can pull these. There's no keycap puller included, unfortunately, but they are very easy to remove. You can buy a third-party keycap set online. The only thing to consider is when you do that, all of these additional keys that are on top, the labels that show you the secondary functions of the keys will now be gone because your universal keycap won't show that. So you can use the Swarm software to help you know, show you which one is which, or um, maybe by the time you change the keys, you'll already be used to that. So I just want to call that out. Now, the other nice thing I like is even though this is a mini, it does have dedicated arrow keys, which is a huge win for me, and a very traditional looking function row at the top because you still have a number pad. I really like this keyboard because to me, this is like the bare minimum as far as key functionality goes 
on a compact keyboard. I really don't like losing my arrow keys regardless of how small it is because there's too many times where it's kind of been inconvenient for me. And I like having the number row at the top because then I have the function keys as my secondary. So it's still pretty versatile. There's no dedicated media keys, of course, because it's a 65%, you can still have the media volume adjustment using M and then the less than greater than keys or comma period, I guess, depending on which function you're looking at. Uh, but overall, it's still pretty capable. It's just very compact. Looking at the back of the keyboard, you have flippable rubber feet. Now there's basically two settings. I had it on the largest one, but you can see this little inner foot. Now what's nice about this, and some of the older ones didn't have this, is there is a rubber liner on the smaller foot and a rubber liner on the larger foot. Some of these keyboards in the past have only had rubber on one or none, and then it just relies on the larger rubber foot on the bottom. So I like that they include that. It's a light board, there's a physical switch on it, the Rockhat logo lights up. So I think the design is really nice. Again, it's just a matter of if this fits what you're looking for from a feature set, but overall for this type of keyboard, I think the design is executed really well. One little detail too about the Mini is there's no more sharp edges unlike the older Vulcan keyboards. And I'll show you the older um, uh, 122 and 121 ammo uh, boards, which this one replaced but they have a smoother like diamond cut edge to them. This has the more of a reflective corner in the mechanical, but the mini has a rolled off corner. It looks fairly sharp, I guess, from a line perspective because of the dual finish, but it's much easier on the hands. It's the little things like that, that if your fingers or hands are touching the side, it doesn't feel like a sharp edge. So it's a little bit more comfortable. Now I'll do a sound test here shortly, but I do want to call out the key switches. So I mentioned that these are red. These use the Titan optical switches, which are amazing switches. They're incredibly fast. And the killer feature of the optical switch is the reliability. These are rated for 150 million keystrokes, whereas a lot of mechanical keyboards or other gaming keyboards are typically 50 to 100 million now. They've been improving, but the optical switch is on the higher end of the side for longevity. So if you're concerned with keys failing or switches failing, doing double presses or missing strokes, it's much, like, much less likely to happen on an optical switch like this. Now, the other thing to consider that's really important with a wireless keyboard is, well, how well does the wireless work? And there were some pros and cons with the Mini Air. Um, this is at the time of the review, so keep that in mind. I did get a firmware update prior to launch, which did fix some of this and it may get better over time or at launch the issue may be non-existent. I just have to share my own experience. So after the latest firmware update that was available to me, which I think was version 0.196, um, I still had occasional wireless dropout issues if my transmitter was farther away. And when I say farther away, my desktop sits on my desk, five feet to my right, and if I put the transmitter behind the tower on one of the uh, USB ports built into the motherboard, I had occasional key drops. Now, latency was never an issue no matter what. So from a competitive standpoint, this has been excellent. It didn't feel like it was holding me back compared to the wired Vulcans or even other keyboards that I own. The drop keys throw thing though, I wasn't a huge fan of. Thankfully, I already had a solution in place because I have uh, dual USB hubs under my desk and I plugged the transmitter in into one of those USB hubs, which made it only about two feet away underneath my desk from the keyboard. Once the transmitter was no longer behind my tower, all of the key drops disappeared. I never had any issues after that, and of course, I still benefited from speed. On the Bluetooth side, it worked perfectly. I never had an issue with Bluetooth, which is funny because you would think Bluetooth would be more problematic, but Bluetooth was rock solid. From a performance standpoint, RF, or the 2.4 gigahertz connector, is going to give you lower latency. So if you're looking at it from a competitive level, try to make the wireless adapter work or use a cable, but Bluetooth is a good second option if that's less of a critical thing for you. Now moving on to the Vulcan 2 Mechanical, I wanna talk about a few improvements to compare it to the older Vulcan because I think this better highlights how much better the new board is. At first, I wasn't too happy about the price increase because the older one, the 121 and 122 uh, Amos, which basically that number indicated what color, they were 120 and they sell for under 100 now. So there are a few changes. Now the Titan mechanical switches that are in the new ones are much more durable. You're going from 50 million keystrokes to 80 million keystrokes. So that was actually an issue with the older ones. Some people were having keystroke failure even prematurely. Um, this is their first in-house switch. So going to this one, they obviously wanted to address that. Now, originally when I was looking at it online, I didn't see a huge difference. And I was trying to understand everything that changed beyond a keystroke. And to me, the overall packaging and fit and finish and design, it looks like it's a more finished, more refined product 
with the Vulcan 2. And if I put them, I'll put one on top of each other and you can see quite a big difference that starts to jump out. Looking at it physically, one of the first things that stood out was the edging. So you have this diamond cut chamfered edge. There's no more sharp edge and it just feels like a more premium board because of that. It's also a lot more comfortable. Physically, they're almost the exact same dimension. It's just a different cut on the edge that to me makes a lot better improvement. Now on the media keys, you also lose, these were clicky, but there's like a soft squishy like rubber and now it's a plastic button. I think the new one is better integrated into the board because if you have a silver and white board like this, having a black cord versus the new one using a silver cord, having a black volume knob versus the white volume knob, the overall board is more true to the color choice that you pick. Everything is basically white and I think it's all integrated better as well. Moving on to the status LEDs, on the old one you had some LEDs on the bottom corner to indicate your status, num lock, caps lock, etc. Whereas on the new one it's integrated into the chin of the keyboard. Now there's more changes and improvements under the hood as well. The back plate is stiffer on the new one, so it's a much stronger keyboard and it's also much better sounding. This is a critical thing for me because the older Rockat keyboards, I think they were one of the best looking boards on the market, but they are kind of noisy. So I'm going to do a sound test so you can hear what I'm talking about. Moving on to the new one. It's a huge improvement. Even the volume knob is improved. The old one. Basically the little teeth, because it's a notchy volume wheel, it's finer on the new one. So it's all these little quality of life improvements. Not only are you getting more durable switches, but they are pre-lubed switches. Um, in fact, on the black one, you can actually see some of the grease that was spread when they first cleaned the board. So I had to do some cleaning, but it's quieter. The switches are more reliable and it's just a more pleasant typing experience. Stabilizers were also improved. The new keys move less. So if you're pressing on the space bar, you have a completely even uh, way to actuate the space bar, which is great. So I want to show you a quick sound test of the new Vulcan Mini Air. And I have the Vulcan Mini here because even though they are essentially the same board, the new Air has a little bit of a resonance to it on the space bar. It's kind of like a pingy sound. So I'm going to start with just the, the space bar test. Here's the older Vulcan 2 Mini that is wired. It's a new keyboard, it's just not the wireless version. And then going to the brand new Air, It's really minor, but if depending on if you're wearing headphones or not, or how it's getting picked up, I think there's just a little bit of a resonance to it. So um, I have this board out. This is a different uh, manufacturer altogether. This is a startup, uh, or it's a Kickstarter board from ASIO. They sell other keyboards, but I just wanted to show you another wireless board in the same price range. So I'm gonna do a typing test real quick on the old versus new. Then I'll switch to the ASIO and go back to the new mini. Mini Air Wireless. And then the ASIO uh, 75, the Terra 75. There's a big difference in sound. If I do a harder, like a stab test, I'll do the caps lock. And let's just do some, uh, we'll do the backspace. Very different sounding boards. There are certain sounds I like better on the Mini Air compared to the ASIO uh, Terra 75. This board is huge. They fit multiple layers on the board to absorb some of the sound. So as a result, it is a heavy tank and some people may or may not like that. This obviously has a lot less RGB. I mainly wanted to focus on the sound test, but some of what makes this sound the way it does is also taking away from the brighter RGB and how light and thin it looks on your desk. So it kind of depends on you know what you value more. Hopefully that gives you a better idea. So now we're gonna take a look at the Swarm software for the Vulcan 2 Mechanical and the Mini Air Wireless. All right, so taking a look at Rockat Swarm software for the Vulcan 2, I'm gonna start with the general features and you can see you have a typing sound, which means that literally when you press a key, it plays a noise through windows and you can see why I have that turned off. Not really my thing. You have character repeat here, which means that if you hold down a key, how long does it take before it starts repeating and then how fast does it repeat after that? 
and then cursor blink rate is self-explanatory as is reset settings. Looking at the bottom of the screen, you can see game profiles. And what's cool about this is you can have the profile auto switch for whenever a certain application is open. By default, it scans which applications are running at the moment, but you can search manually and pick the executable that you want associated with it. Heading over to key assignment, this is where you can obviously do key rebinds, but there's also a good feature that's uh, kind of been out for Rocket products for a while now, and that's called Easy Shift. So when you press the Easy Shift button down, you can basically assign additional functions for essentially every single key on the keyboard. This gives you a lot more versatility in case you want to program special features. You can even have it set to do shortcuts, system commands, etc. And then moving on to the key illumination software, AMO is the intelligent lighting system, which is also reactive. So if you press a button on the key, it will react accordingly. Now you can have that synchronized. So any Rocket product that supports AMO, which include their mice, they can basically sync up with each other. So if the keyboard is fading from you know, blue to purple, the mouse on the right will kind of follow the right edge of the keyboard as well. If you don't want to do that, you can specify your own. You have the wave setting, of course, and snake. There's a lot of different patterns and you, on this one, you can pick your own gradients even. So you can kind of pick what theme you want. And you'll see this kind of refresh here in a second because I have auto applying enabled. If I go down though, you have fully lit, heartbeat, breathing. There's, it's pretty self-explanatory as far as how it works. But if you go to custom mode, this is where you can specify uh, everything that you're adjusting. Now you can click each key, change the key individually, and you have individual key brightness. So you can really customize it a lot. You can also use the drag to click or drag to highlight, I should say. So if you wanna quickly target an entire zone of the keyboard, you can do that. And then I can pick any color I want and you'll see it instantly applied to the keyboard. So pretty easy to do, you can really kind of make it your own or you can just leave it on the default profile and plug and play. So with that being said, some of the same stuff applies from the Vulcan 2 that just came out, but the Air has a couple additional features obviously to adjust because of the battery. So these top things are the same. I'm just going to scroll down. Now you get a battery readout with the signal strength meter, which is great. And this is showing 77%, which is another nice feature because I hate it when some companies just give you like four bars or it goes from 100 to 75 to 50. So having something more granular helps for long term. Now with the Mini Air, you also get a setting called proximity sensor, and that literally is a proximity sensor on the keyboard. There's a physical sensor that detects if your hands are by the keys or not, and if it's away, it will dim the keyboard. You have the ability to change the sensitivity, but I've left it on default. It even advises you not to change it unless you're having issues if you adjust the slider. In standby mode, you're basically dimming the keyboard and that's adjusting how fast it dims. So you can set it from five seconds all the way to 300 seconds, or you can turn standby mode off if you just wanna leave the keyboard bright. Sleep mode is when it fully goes to sleep and the RGB shuts off entirely. And if you press a key on the keyboard, it'll automatically turn back on. Just like the Vulcan 2, you have profiles at the bottom and you can still associate it to different programs. So you can have the keyboard auto switch. That's more relevant if you're changing key assignments and you want different key bindings to be associated with different games or programs. Now moving over to key assignment, this is also a good resource to show you what the special LEDs do because there's actually, if you click on things like this, it'll highlight which key binding is associated to what. Basically, because this has dual LEDs, you can use it for status indicators, changing your brightness, showing your battery life, etc. can all be associated to the secondary LED and change color accordingly. Now, in addition to your profiles that are associated here at the bottom, you can also leverage Macro Manager, which has various games. And I thought Call of Duty was missing because I didn't see it up top, but if you scroll down, it's under Modern Warfare 2. So there's some games there, not every single game is, but it'll at least get you started. I think most people that are really hardcore about their games are going to program their own anyway, but at least this gives you a rough idea on getting something set up rather quickly. So the Swarm software, as you can see, is very similar between both boards. If you've owned prior Rock Hat products, you'll be very very familiar with how to set this up. The only thing I'm going to say is this though, I mentioned the firmware update for the Mini Air Wireless before. I had a ton of issues updating my Mini Air Wireless and I discovered a way to fix it. So initially it kept telling me I had to update the firmware and I couldn't skip it, which means I couldn't customize the board. However, every time I try to do the firmware update, the firmware update would fail, making the board not customizable in any way. So my solution after giving up for almost an hour of attempting to fix it and rebooting and disabling software is I plug this into my son's computer who's using a different Rocket board, so Swarm is already installed. It applied the firmware just fine. I had no issues. 
went back to my computer and my computer still said it needed to do a firmware update only this time it didn't even give me the option to try. So what I ended up doing was I shut down Swarm software altogether. I went into my app data folder, looked for the Rockhat folder, and in the configs file it shows you all the profiles of every Rockhat device connected that's been detected by Swarm. I deleted both files created for the Vulkan Mini Air, um, which includes the dongle and the keyboard itself. So I deleted those files, then I reopened Swarm. I didn't just minimize it by the way, you have to make sure in your taskbar that Swarm is closed. But once I did that, I opened Swarm up again and voila, everything worked fine. So that I've reviewed so many Rockat products and over the years and I've never had an issue like that before. So it's probably unlikely you'll run into that. However, if you do, that seems to be a work uh, working solution. So hopefully you don't run into that, but if you do, don't give up on the board. That might be the only fix and then you'll be good to go. So that about wraps up the review. I think there's some huge wins here and then a couple misses or things that I guess could have made it better. I wish the wireless performance worked a little bit better on the air and I wish they had PBT caps. If those two things were there, they'd have a real hit in their hands even at this price range. This market is crazy competitive and if you don't need the uh, Hall effect switches, which use magnetics instead of optical or mechanical, these are great boards to consider. Now the Rocket Swarm software may look a little bit old and outdated, but it's still very easy to customize and it's lightweight on your system. It's not a huge resource hog, which I would typically prefer. I don't usually look at that software too often once I've dialed everything in. So to me, the lighter footprint is great. So with that being said, I hope you found the video helpful and I helped answer any questions you may have had. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'd love to see you at the next video. And with that being said, I'll see you next time. Take care.